thinking about how we're going to approach architectural history. So I'm going to describe my approach. You'll see it popping up in my lectures. And whether it's uh, after a class now in section or uh, after some of my lectures, you can ask your instructor in section whether or not they agree with my approach because there may be some area for discussion there. But I'm going to refer to what in the 19th century was, for, 19th century was, was referred to as zeitgeist or spirit of the age. So a culture will have a sense of what it's about and then reflect that sense in its arts. Here's a very German architect, became American, Mies van der Rohe, who did the Seagram Building here in Manhattan. And Mies wrote, architecture is the real battleground of the spirit. Architecture depends on its time. It is the crystallization of the inner structure of its time, the slow unfolding of its form. So that's the definition I gave you of architecture at the beginning of this talk. So that's sort of how I approach architecture. There are many other ways to approach it. But with that thought in mind, let's look at two homes. They're similar in that they are for uh, royalty, in the case of Japan, a relative of the emperor, and here for a retired clergyman in Italy. This is Katsura Imperial Villa. Um, Donald Cromley will be addressing that in detail next semester. And this is Villa Rotunda in Italy, we'll be looking at when we talk about the Renaissance. So let's sort of look at what's the Japanese, well, let's start over here in, the, in Renaissance Italy. What, who, who and what are we? Say, well, uh, we're natural creatures who evolve by the accidents of evolution, natural selection, in a physical, material world that is governed by the laws of science. That's, you know, one point of view. So the world is material and the laws of nature. Human beings came about through random accidents and consciousness is the firing of neurons and the individual is central. So I sit upon this hill and survey out, understand through science and control nature. Here, we look very much integrated into nature. The world has always been and will not end. Our individual consciousness is a partaking in a component of the world. Human beings are natural creatures the natural world is imbued with spirit. Therefore, human nature and the spiritual are all one unified whole. They're not separate things. And so we see the human residence very integrated into nature. Now, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to discuss what do we mean by nature? Because all this is human plan, as is this. So. You know, nature's very tricky. So here we are at Katsura, and we're asymmetrical, meandering, and an integration of inside and outside. Natural materials, our wood frame, our posts set upon stones, crushed rock here to catch the rain runoff from the roof and then non-bearing infill panels that can open to let inside integrate with outside. And we can sit here and contemplate the views. Space in Japan is like an onion of layers. Here we are in Renaissance Italy. A human being is a physical bodily thing, like a machine. So here we are around the time of Michelangelo, Vesalius does his book of anatomy, looking at how all the muscles work together. You can tell that Michelangelo had studied that stuff in order to 
be able to do a sculpture that's that idealized but realistic. The position of the individual person determines our perspective point of view. And we dominate nature. And so at the center of these Cartesian coordinates, x, y, z axes, x, y, and z vertical, stands the human being. So in contrast, here's a passage from the Tao Te Ching, which is a Chinese document. Do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not think it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. What is a fundamental Western activity that we're engaged in that thinks that we can take over and improve nature? Science. <laughs> so here's a book by a futurist named Ray Kurzweil. He says, it may only take a quarter of a millennium, 250 years, to go from sending message on horseback to saturating the matter and energy of our solar system with sublimely intelligent processes. He envisions, right now we can, you know, zap messages through fiber cables around the globe, bounce them up to satellites and back, bounce them off the moon and get them back. We can communicate with our explorer satellites that are now gone beyond the edges of the solar system. We can gather light from stars near the beginning of the Big Bang and decipher what the stars are made of, the processes and the, of their subatomic activities. And so he envisions us spreading that not only to the moon and to Mars throughout the solar system, but throughout the galaxy. And he doesn't want to be stopped by that. The ongoing expansion of our future superintelligence will then require moving out to the rest of the universe where we may engineer new universes. Other person thinking like that, Seth Lloyd, he wrote a book called Programming the Universe. The universe is a computational, uh, it's a quantum computation, and he's going to reprogram it. <laughs> so, big contrast the way these people think and the way these people think. Um, what's, how do these points of view interact in our world today? What kind of point of view would you associate this thinking with today? An environmentalist, an ecologist? This kind of thinking is still very present in the world today, as is this. So, contrast to 1500s Italy, 1600s Japan, human being in the center, meandering into the landscape. Let me end with this slide. Here are the two buildings we just looked at. Here's Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Which of these two do you find Falling Water more similar to? Something to think about. Words, what kind of ideas are prevalent in our culture today? Okay, thank you.